Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright and welcome to The Long Read from Stuff. This episode is called The Nazi and the Mountain. It was written by press reporter Charlie Gates, who joins me now. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Mike. Why did you write this story? Well, uh, when Willie Huber died, uh, so he was the man who founded Mount Hutt in the 1970s. He died in August last year, and there were a lot of stories on stuff about what to do about his name on the ski field. He lent his name to a, a ski run there and a cafe. And the guy who ran the ski field there, Mount Hutt Ski Field, said, we're not going to tape his name away unless someone comes up with evidence that he committed war crimes. And that really kind of got my brain thinking, because I, I thought, firstly, I kind of felt like there was a responsibility to find out. If no one knew, there must be a way of finding out. There must be war records. There must be some kind of evidence that would show where Willie Huber served and perhaps give some idea of what he saw and you know how deep into the Nazi military machine was he. And so... It was kind of a naive inquiry in a way, because I don't have a lot of experience with military reporting or war reporting, but it's just something I thought you could find out if you dug hard enough and deep enough. Turned out it was a lot trickier (laughs) than I initially thought. That is actually quite hard, because they didn't write down in their diaries, you know, that they committed atrocities that day, they destroyed evidence, and so often they get away with it, they're not charged. So it's very hard to prove that. And so it became quite a a long quest to find any kind of documentary evidence of Huber's war record. And so I hooked up with a guy in Berlin called Haus Hillenbrand, who's um, co-wrote this story. And he dug into the uh, Federal Archives in Berlin to see what he could find, kind of POW records, some military records of when he joined up. And from that, we also found out what division he was in and were then able to trace some of the movements of that division, which would give us an idea of where he served and what was going on in those areas. And from that, we were able to kind of piece together quite what his experience in the war was and his the depth of his commitment to the Nazi machine. That commitment, as you found out, was reasonably deep, and that has prompted a reckoning of sorts in New Zealand and in the the Canterbury and and ski communities about what to do and how to deal with this. What happened there? How how did they deal with that? His family and his friends and the ski field all found it very hard to reckon with his Nazi past. He was their friend. They'd known him for a very long time. He was fundamental in the founding of the ski field. He was a key part of the community and seen as a local hero. And so when suddenly this evidence was presented that he served in one of the you know, most hardcore Nazi divisions in the war, I think they, they have all found it very hard to come to terms with that. The ski field initially resisted kind of dropping the name and later did, and his friends and family still stand by him and say he did nothing wrong, he saw no war crimes, he saw no evidence of the Holocaust, despite evidence that he was in areas where very bad things were happening. Thanks, Charlie. Now here is Charlie reading his story, The Nazi and the Mountain. Don Church first met Willie Huber in 1974. They worked together on Mount Hutt Ski Field near Christchurch in the 1970s during its pioneer years. Huber was the first manager of the field, and they were both directors of the company that ran Mount Hutt. In their downtime... They would hit the slopes together. Church would often go over to dinner with Willie and his wife Edna at their home. His Austrian friend was warm with a ready smile. Church loved his geniality. Their friendship lasted for 45 years. Their ski partnership lasted almost as long. They could still be seen on the slopes together in the 2010s, when Huber was in his 90s. But Church knew that his friend had a past one that was very different to their days at Mount Hutt. Huber had fought for the Nazis in World War II. He was a machine gunner in a tank division and saw action on the notorious Russian front and Nazi-occupied France. 
when Church asked Huber about his war experiences, he would chat openly and show Church old photographs and files. He told Church about the brutality of fighting through a Russian winter and showed him the scars on his wrists where lice had gnawed at his body. But when the conversation delved deeper, things took a turn. Church asked his friend if he had seen atrocities or evidence of the Holocaust. Huber, usually effusive, would go quiet. He said he saw nothing. Nothing about the Holocaust would ever come out, said Church, except that it was wrong, and then he would clam up. I think he was ashamed to think about it. His attitude was, it wasn't him and he wasn't there. And that was where the matter lay. For decades, no one ever probed too deeply into Willy Huber's Nazi past. Instead, he was lauded by his community for his work on founding Mount Hutt Ski Field in the 1970s and his later efforts on the mountain. His pioneer myth was burnished by media profiles that glossed over his war years or left his lack of repentance unexamined. If people had probed further, they would have found that Huber volunteered for a fearsome Nazi division, served in areas where war crimes happened, and then didn't tell the truth about that military past in his immigration application for New Zealand. These facts were laid bare in a comprehensive North and South feature on Huber in May 2021, nine months after his death. Even then, there was still an unwillingness to reassess his legacy. His friends stood by him. The ski field he helped found initially resisted calls to drop his name from a ski run and a cafe, but later changed their mind after pressure from local businesses. But the woman who was closest to him his widow, Edna Huber, remained silent. Until now. Huber was born in 1923 and grew up near the town of Schladming in the Austrian Alps. He became a member of the Hitler Youth in his teens and then volunteered for the Waffen SS, joining on October 1st, 1941, at the age of 18. The Waffen SS was the military branch of the notorious and zealously fascist SS, the Nazi party's paramilitary group. The division of the Waffen SS that Huber joined was known as Das Reich and was one of the most feared fighting units in the Nazi war machine. Huber was a machine gunner on a tank and would win two medals for his actions in the division. In his book about Das Reich, military historian Yves Buffetot described the division as, quote, arguably the most emblematic unit of the SS. Most of its recruits were young, unmarried men, usually raised through the Hitler Youth system and imbued with die-hard ideology. Historian Peter Lieb agreed. The division, he wrote, had a large number of hardened National Socialists in their ranks. Volunteering for the SS is seen by historians as a clear sign that Huber at least sympathised with Nazi ideals. He could have just joined the German army and become an ordinary soldier, rather than enlisting in a division filled with die-hard Nazis. Huber saw his first major and sustained combat with Das Reich on the Russian front from January 1943. The division fought in Adolf Hitler's Eastern Folly as it descended into a brutal quagmire. Das Reich served there for 15 cold, grim months. They ran out of food, ammunition and petrol. Many died of cold and hunger. Huber slept on the bare snow under his tank. He went through hell on the Russian front, Huber's friend Don Church said. He told me about how they were living underground and they were infested with lice. He could show rings at the end of his wrists where the lice had caused permanent scars. But the division inflicted its own kind of hell on others. Yves Buffetot wrote that in Russia, the division used scorched earth tactics and that, quote, massacring civilians and raising villages to the ground was commonplace. Analysis of Huber's war record by military historians 
shows it would have been almost impossible for him to have missed the grim realities of a Holocaust unfolding around him. Victoria University Associate Professor Giacomo Lichtner has tracked Das Reich across the Eastern Front. He cross-referenced the division's movements with locations of atrocities in the region. He doubts Huber's claim that he saw no signs of the Holocaust during his time in the Waffen-SS. It's not realistic to say you could serve in those areas for a long time without witnessing or hearing of something, Lichtner said. His research shows that in 1943, Huber would have been stationed in at least 29 towns where large Jewish populations had been recently exterminated by the Nazis before his arrival. The mass graves would have been relatively fresh when Huber arrived. Huber would have also seen signs of a Nazi operation to destroy evidence of the Holocaust, Lichtner said, disinterring bodies from mass graves and burning them. Huber would have smelt the rotting corpses and seen the smoke from the burning pyres. Lichtner also places Huber in the Ukrainian city of Berdikev in November 1943, around the time when 60 Jews were murdered by Nazis in the town. They had already exterminated 20,000 Jews in Berdikev from July to September 1941. In August 1943, Huber received a second-class Iron Cross for his actions in the Kursk tank battle on the Russian front. It was one of the largest tank battles in military history. Two months later, Huber was promoted and commanded four privates in his tank crew. Das Reich's brutal campaign continued once it was deployed to Nazi-occupied France in April 1944. The division murdered civilians with machine guns burnt farms and deported hundreds of people. One of the worst instances came in June 1944, when Das Reich rounded up everyone living in the small southwestern town of Toul. They hanged 99 civilians from lampposts lining the street. Research by journalist Naomi Arnold and military historian Andrew MacDonald for North and South magazine found Huber probably passed through Toul on the same day as the mass hanging. In September 1944, Huber was decorated again, this time with a first-class Iron Cross for fighting against the Allied liberation of France around Normandy. Near the end of the war, Huber was attacked by a Russian soldier who stabbed him in his chest and leg. Huber shot him with his pistol. He was hospitalised but discharged himself and fled for home in Austria. He got close before his injuries forced him back to hospital. Because he volunteered for the Waffen-SS, a fellow Austrian reported Huber to the Allied forces. He was captured on July 21st, 1945, and sent to a prisoner of war camp in Italy. Nearly a year later, he was freed, and after four and a half years away, he returned to his home village in Austria in June 1946. In his History of Das Reich, Buffato gives a diplomatic summary of the division. Once the Nazis had lost the war and evidence of the Holocaust emerged, Das Reich leaders set about rehabilitating their image. They ran a lifelong campaign to, quote, establish that the Waffen-SS were frontline troops who sacrificed themselves in combat, not domestic henchmen of a murderous regime. Given the ruthlessness of the war in Russia and certain ramifications that carried over to the West, the lines were sometimes blurred. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, host of The Long Read. If you're an advertiser and you like what you're hearing, you could help us keep making podcasts like this one. Thousands of people listen to stuff podcasts every day. So if you'd like to be part of one of New Zealand's biggest and best podcast platforms, Go to advertise.stuff.co.nz slash audio and get in touch with us. Back to the show. After the war, Huber became a mountain guide and ski instructor in Austria. While guiding, he met an English doctor who studied at Otago University. The doctor told him about New Zealand and its mountains, urging Huber to go there under a new immigration scheme for carpenters. 
Huber had no carpentry skills, but a recommendation from the doctor got him in. He moved to New Zealand in 1953 and became a permanent resident in 1955. In a supporting letter to immigration authorities, Huber wrote, I have never been a member of any illegal organisation. This was not true. The Waffen-SS was deemed a criminal organisation during the Nuremberg trials in 1945 and 1946. But the lie held for many decades. Willy Huber built a new life for himself in New Zealand. He built a ski field and became a local legend. He settled in Christchurch and then Geraldine. In later life, the media came calling, keen to retell his legend. The coverage was largely uncritical, focusing more on his myth-making exploits up Mount Hutt than his war record. One stuff profile described him as a decorated German war hero who volunteered for the German army. Another story also skirted his military past, saying he was a political prisoner during his time as a POW in Italy. It wasn't until a 2017 TVNZ profile that Huber admitted publicly that he was in the Waffen-SS. In the interview for the Sunday programme, he smiled as he recalled seeing Adolf Hitler. I saw Hitler when I was nine years old, Huber said. Could you imagine? He was smiling. He looked at us, put his arm up like he always did. He denied he had any knowledge of the concentration camps during the war and described Hitler as a very clever leader who helped Austria. After his death in August 2020, Huber's Nazi past was given more prominence in media reports. In May, North and South revealed the lie on his immigration records about his membership of the Waffen-SS. It also placed him near the scenes of wartime atrocities. The ski field that Huber helped found struggled with this legacy. Soon after his death, a 7,000-strong petition called for the removal of Huber's name from a ski run and a cafe at Mount Hutt. Jewish groups said it was, quote, inappropriate for anything to be named after an unrepentant Nazi. This is not a legacy to be proud of and is an insult to all those murdered by the Nazis or who died fighting the Nazis, the petition read. How lucky Mr Huber was to be able to make a new start something that was not afforded to the victims murdered by the SS. In September, Mount Hutt ski area manager James McKenzie said they would keep the name unless they were shown evidence that Huber had been involved in war crimes. By February, Huber's name had been dropped, even though no evidence of war crimes had emerged. Only a plaque remained marking where Huber spent the winter during his research to found the ski field. New Zealand Jewish Council spokeswoman Juliette Moses said it was commercial pressure from other parties that forced the decision. She said NZ Ski, which owns Mount Hutt, only changed their mind once they came under commercial pressure from Winter Pride, an annual ski festival for the LGBTQ plus community that has been held at NZ Ski Fields for more than a decade. The festival also runs a pride pledge system that companies can display if they have proven a commitment to be rainbow inclusive. Pride Pledge and Winter Pride director Martin King said he asked NZ Ski not to memorialise a Nazi on Mount Hutt. As well as persecuting and murdering millions of Jews, the Nazis also sent thousands of gay people to concentration camps. King told Mount Hutt that unless they dropped the Huber name from the ski running cafe, they would no longer hold their annual event on NZ ski fields. They also threatened to pull the Pride Pledge from the company if they took no action. Mackenzie said it was not a commercial decision to drop the name. You can't please all of the people all of the time, he said. There was a risk to our business either way, whether we kept the Huber name or not. It won't make any difference to Mount Hutt commercially. A lot of people were ambivalent about what we did. Mackenzie said they changed their minds after speaking to groups like the Jewish Council and the general pride community. 
grappling with how to mark Huber's contribution to Mount Hutt was complex and difficult. There is no right or wrong with anything, Mackenzie said. There is no black and white with things in life. The fog of war may turn everything grey, but this much is certain. There's no documentary evidence that Huber took part in war crimes or Holocaust atrocities, and he didn't work as a guard at a concentration camp. But his war record shows that he volunteered for a division famed for its commitment to Nazi ideals and brutal tactics, served in places where awareness of atrocities would have been unavoidable, didn't tell the truth about his war record to New Zealand immigration authorities, and never seemed to publicly repent for his time in the SS. In the face of all this evidence, Huber's friends still believe his claim that he knew nothing about the Holocaust during the war. His friend Don Church thinks the extensive media coverage exposing Huber's war record has been a hit job. I do believe him, Church said. I've probably known Willie longer and had more opportunity to discuss things with him than most would. I would take his word for it. Ernest Butch Stern, whose Jewish parents fled Austria for the US in 1938, was friends with Huber for many years. He doesn't think his friends should be judged by his war record alone. He came here and got himself a new life and contributed to society, Stern said. Everybody deserves a second shot, and he got one. Willie Huber has one final defender, one who knew him better than anyone and has never spoken before. Edna Huber moved from England to Australia in 1948. On a tour of New Zealand, she visited Mount Cook. While there, she met a keen Austrian man. He wanted to climb the mountain that day, but couldn't because of poor weather. Willie and Edna married in 1956 and had four children together. Speaking for the first time since her husband's death, she defended the man she was married to for more than 65 years. She had kept silent until now because she didn't want to upset her children. But she felt her late husband was being maligned and wanted to speak out. If it was just me, I would stand in Cathedral Square on a soapbox, she said. Edna Huber rejected the idea that her husband may have witnessed atrocities or had Nazi sympathies. I was married to him for over 65 years, she said, so I know what he was like and everything about him. He was in the right places. He wasn't involved in any of the things that were very bad in the war. She said her husband knew nothing of the Holocaust until after the war ended. I know the whole story. It has been the same for 65 years. It never changed at all. He told me everything about everything. He didn't know anything about it. She said the scrutiny of her husband's war record since his death had been disturbing. We have subscribed to the press since 1956, she said. But this year, I cancelled the subscription because it's distressing. She said her husband was traumatised by his wartime experiences. Decades later, he still felt twinges of pain from the wounds sustained when he was stabbed by a Russian soldier. He would have nightmares about his time in the prisoner of war camp, she said. They were starving. A lot of people that weren't as strong died. It was pretty horrific. We may never know the full truth about Huber's four years in the service of the Nazi regime, but while some secrets die hard, the truth sometimes has a way of coming to the surface. In autumn 1943, Soviet journalist Vasily Grossman saw mass graves in the areas of Eastern Europe where Huber served and where Nazi death squads murdered millions of Jews. The earth is throwing out crushed bones, teeth, clothes, papers, Grossman wrote. It does not want to keep secrets.
That was The Nazi and the Mountain on The Long Read from Stuff, written and read by Charlie Gates and produced by me, Michael Wright. This episode was mixed by Jack Price. Stuff's podcast director is Adam Duddy. If you listened via our website, you can hear this story and more like it on The Long Read podcast, available on all the usual platforms. If you like what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening.